Next, we have Alberto Cavallo from the MIT, from the Sloan School of Management. He will speak of index, in, um, index for estimation of price, PPM, billion price project. Thank you, I'm Alberto Cavallo. Hopefully you can hear me. I can only hear the moderator, but first of all, I thank you for the opportunity to participate. I apologize for not being in Mexico in person, and hopefully technology will help us in this session. Um, I'm Argentinian, so I think I congratulate all the Mexicans for the game. For an Argentinian, it's um, the the second best thing after Argentina winning is Brazil not winning. So um, while I work at the MIT, at the yeah MIT, and I'm going to speak of an experience of price building or um, or inflation measuring through prices we obtain uh, online. It's called the Billion Prices Project. It's academic. And it's for economic research and macro issues, which are the issues I work on, macroeconomics, and to explore forms in which online data can be used for the measurement of uh, on internet. Our case is an example of practical applications for big data. So let me begin. Hopefully, you can read this, I mean, if you can, hopefully you can see this clearly, but if there's any pr problem, please ask, tell, tell the moderator, and if you need to, 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 if you need me to stop and ask me any question, please do so. When you, we speak of macroeconomics and prices data, you find three um, it, data. You can check the micro prices from the Statistics agencies such as INEHI, you can ob obtain data at the product level used to build uh, indexes like the IPG. It's a source of data that for economists can be difficult to access because this data it usually has um, are sometimes secret, and so it's not easy to do the research. However, data that some, sometimes this data can be very attractive because of its possible applications. Something else is that, well, 10 years ago, we have scanner data companies such as Nielsen uh, collects information to do market research. And as of recent, as of late, there's been use of data online for um, the Billion Prices Project is an example of this. Um, we can do this for macroeconomics. We can do it to measure how prices change. Um, we have an expansive monetary policy, um, market segmentation, and a national economist is using it to understand price differences internationally, uh, real exchange rates, and what kind of effects or variables may impact these calculations. But it can also be used to measure um, other economic indicators, including inflation, which is what I will speak of today. Before I speak, I, I think it's important to understand that these data sources have different advantages and disadvantages, which is the first step to understanding what they're good for. If you think of the IPC or CTI, um, it's measured to, to, it's created to measure inflation. That's how we've measured it um, in most countries in the last 50 years. The best thing to consider is that we have a representative sample. We've selected this. We have commerces in many places where we collect the data. We have long time frames, which of course is important for economists that want to conduct analysis with these statistics. And we know that we've collected 
this um, information online, which is where most of this occurs. The problem is that it has a high price. Um, it's hard to obtain this information, and one of the effects of this is that we have a very low frequency. It's normally monthly. In Australia, New Zealand, it's quarterly. We have a limited number of goods. When one of the zones that needs to collect data visits one of these stores, well, it they need to choose a small amount of product. Some of prices need to be disputed, and well, um, and it's not very useful useful for international comparisons. Say when the World Bank wants to conduct PPP comparisons because each country is, well, is concerned with its own basic foodstuffs. So the selection of products measured is not the same in each country. So that makes comparing difficulty difficult. So this was, this appeared 10 years ago, this data from the supermarkets when there are purchases, the advantages, the granularity of the data. We have data for all products. We can know how much of each product was sold, and we have high frequency. This is reported every week. What are the advantages? Well, there is a high collection cost, and if you want to to do this, you have to start as, as Nielsen, and there's a few a very small amount of places like the IPC. Um, the characteristics of the ATA that vary depending on the country and the supplier and the time period being used. So it's hard to compare internationally because what happens is that the price indicator is a barcode that is defined um, regionally. So the advantages, the main advantages is that we report um, um, that we report values, unit values, where the price is calculated according to the, the, the amount sold, this divided by the unit sold. So the unit value, well, leads to a, since we have this, we have um, a, a, a vary because the, 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 because, well, it generates biases in the measurement of, of, um, Inflation because it's not always accurate. So those who have tried to measure this have have problems with what we call uh, something like chain drift. So this makes calculating inflation difficult. The third source of data is online data. I'll tell you how you collect it, so you understand. This is collected, first of all, from commerces that sell or show prices online. This doesn't mean they need to be uh, only online stores. In the US, we don't limit. Actually, we don't obtain data from sites such as Amazon.com. What we try and obtain is data from the large retailers who sell in the real world. and. So if you, okay, I'm showing the Apple store, but there are other commerces such as Walmart, Target, who sell, they have a large amount of the offline market, but they also show their online prices. So you can make a software enter them because these are public websites and behind this, organized and pretty website. There's an HTML code, which basically has what we call tags or parts of the code, which are constant along time, at least while the general format of the website is maintained. So you show a software to, to understand this data, understand the HTML, and to understand when the product begins and ends. So I've simplified it a bit, but you could basically tell the software. You can say, oh, when you see so product, uh, find the variables that each of the parties need for the database. 
or, or start product. Yes, so the model is what it collects from product ID all the way to the um, apostrophe. So you need to op optimize the software and give it certain parameters. But once this is done, you can make the software work automatically, periodically. We do it every day. And basically, the software collects all the prices in these commerces of all the products sold every day. So um, we can create a large database. We can collect it uh, throughout time for all the products sold. So what are the advantages? Well, one of them is frequency. One of them, it, it, this can be done very quickly. We, especially when compared to traditional mechanisms such as data capturing. So we have a details of the products on the website. This is information we can collect. These are all the goods and varieties available at the store. And if there's a new product available, the first day it's shown on the website, we can capture it. So this has an, an effect on quality adjustment, which is what we will discuss afterwards. And then you can make your comparisons because you can collect all the all the products sold where where you have, of course, better chances of doing this. So disadvantages is well, there's less commerces and places to 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 obtain the data from the, compared to the IPC. Not all categories are going to be online. With time, it's possible that services will increase. Time series are short. We started our work in 2008. So for some countries, we have five years data. We can compare it with, well, compared to CPI, it's much lower though. And it's potential that the online market um, prices behave differently than those offline, which is where most transactions take place. So we will tell you a bit of what we've done. Since 2008, we created this project called the Billion Prices Project with Enrique. It's an academic project. Through our time, we've incorporated commerces and countries to our data. Today, we have data from about 50 countries, which we collect prices from the largest one, the, the largest stores and commerces in the country, particularly six categories, five which are food, electronics, household items, price of gas, energy, and some services enter within these calculations. In general, we try to capture at least, um, well, online before creating an index, 60 or 70 percent of the IBC um, basic products, um, and that and that's when we create the we have the data for the index. So, um, what I'm going to focus is on measuring inflation. So how we started with this, I'm Argentinian, as I said, and by mere chance, I started working on this subject because when I was a doctoral student back in the 90s, I wanted to research on price adjusting or when there's an expensive monetary policy. Initially, we had used that data from the IPC, but it's hard to have access to this disaggregated. So the at the same time, the government of Argentina started lying with their with their statistics. It's I think it's not controversial to say that Argentina Argentina currently lies when it comes to, to its price indexes. In two thousand six we started, well, there were rumors that the government was concerned with inflation because it was at, in double digits and was trying to convince people responsible of statistics and the index to inform them what were the stores which they were looking for these prices because the government had attempted to impose price control and they wanted to go to these um, people and ensure that the people they were giving were th those of the price control. So the people of the 
Institute of Statistics that was a very good one right now. Right. It, it was a very good one, and they denied. They didn't want to do it, and they, um, a few months later, they replaced the entire upper management, especially the people in charge of aggregating inflation data. And from there on, statistics became a bit strange. They never were, went more than 10 percent, were more than 10 percent. They were, um, you could say, ironed. But if you measured um, inflation expectations and you asked people, people said that they felt it was much higher. And the expectations of and, and the yellow line, they, 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 they rocketed to 30 percent. So that's when we decided to to see if we could uh, obtain alternative data. Um, there were certain economists that sent people to markets and they created um, baskets and, and obtained higher um, inflation. They said, oh, that's not representative. But the fact that we could do it online is that we can base or use all the products on sale in these large supermarkets and try to experiment with different baskets and see if what, what, what we can do. I, I wrote a paper on this. So it's a paper. We have the, the quote down there. And it says that if we use online data, you could have a pretty good approximation to the IPCs of four countries of Latin America. Uh, uh, Argentina, both Chile, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil. And I want to do this in Venezuela to show it wasn't an issue of, of the lack of matches or tracking was not a problem of the fact that um, Argentina had a very high inflation. Well, it was the same case in, Ar in Venezuela, it had an official um, Inflation of 25, 30 percent. The government recognized it in Argentina. It was different, and you can see in the index on the left that these indexes are normalized. The solid line is the everyday price, and the dotted line is the IPC or price index. After three, four years, the graph, well, the difference was astronomical, but when you see the annual inflation document, you can see that there's a huge level in difference. But they behave quite the same. But if you're going to lie about statistics, you have to, uh, to be at least dynamically consistent. You can't, if the economy is in the recession, you can say inflation is 10% and you continue saying it's 10%. No, of course, they had to, to, to reduce it at some point. And the Argentinian economy was in a recession because of a global economy. They even reduced the official inflation at the same time the uh, the world economy improved. So we wanted to see if it had to do with different baskets or different um, measurements. So I, I experimented on how you could possibly reach official statistics and I thought the only way and I realized that the only way to reach a similar one it was to um, take the online inflation and divide it exactly by three and it was interesting to discover that it was manipulation and not as complicated as in the past imagine trying to intervene the institute of statistics it's not easy if you want to lie at the level of general prices because you have to replace replace people it, it was easier for the argentinian government to say let's replace the people aggregating the numbers and that these people will give us a result that's better for us and i think that's what happened they always report between two and three percent divided by two, by three, what the real official inflation was. And well, the scandal has not ended. Because of the scandal, Argentina had to launch a new price index in 2014. What you're seeing is a graph that we published every day and on our website. It shows monthly inf inflation of online data versus the official IPC. 
um, the blue line is the official IPC. We've superimposed one index to the other. You can see how during five, six years, official inflation at the monthly level was much lower than the one we detected. And then in January, they launched a new price index for Argentina. And the first year was exactly the same as the number we published. But unfortunately, by the next month, it was much lower than the official one. Um, even though in the last months you are going to see how uh, inflation is dropping and official data is also dropping. So I think it's, there's very little data to really know if the Argentinian government is lying or not. Um, it can take at least a year because in some months when you compare it to what's being done in other countries, it's normal for there to be temporary uh, differences with the official index. So now I'm going to speak a bit of this. So it's early to, to say this. All this experience with Argentina led us to create the BPP, Building Prices Project. In 2010, we started creating, uh, publishing an index for the US, and then we created a company uh, called Price Stats in 2011, which publishes daily infl in inflation indexes to 22 countries in real time with a three day lag. Um, we don't published in the case of Mexico and index yet. The motive is that we wait to have at least three or four years of data for a country before we, so we can look in re retrospect and understand what portion of this data is good for building an index and and, and that's the moment where we start the methodology. Well, is we're using this software, downloads this data, the aggregately, and then we use it to calculate inflation indexes. What you're now looking at are the countries from which we uh, produce this index. In yellow and uh, blue are the countries from which we have uh, data. We recently added Turkey. There are other countries in which we collect data, such as Mexico. Uh, and, and in general, what we are doing is that we try to measure exactly the same phenomenon with the techniques, with the standard inflation measurement techniques, um, the ones that all the statistical institutes use, but with an alternative data source. And our data in general has uh, several characteristics if compared with uh, official um, information at the midterm, there's always um, a congr there's always matching. The case of Argentina is an exception, but there are also short-term differences because it is an alternative data source. There have to be methodological differences that can induce uh, also differences. And the main use up to this point is to anticipate the major trend changes in inflation. Because obviously, uh, financial sectors are interested on this. And online data gives us a good power to um, do this, but not only because we can measure information beforehand and publish it beforehand but also because many countries react beforehand and, um, with uh, online and uh, offline prices. Now what you're looking at now is the index that we produced for the United States. This is published every day with just uh, three days delay. And uh, this level is particularly good to detect changes on inflation. The first point that I'm marking here was in uh, September the 15th, 2008, years after Lehman's Brothers, uh, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. We immediately saw that retailers were reducing their prices, price uh, reductions. The IPC was published in, uh, in December. And that is a trend that continued and that continued to December the 20th. That was where uh, this uh, uh, crisis was in full force in the United States. That's a good index to detect trend changes in inflation. This is the yearly inflation of these same indexes. As you can see, it approaches. It, well, it is very close, but it's a period of, of time in which there is a difference, temporary differences. And this is the monthly inflation index. With this, we can show the same uh, way you can see peaks before these peaks happen with the CPI. And this is what I said before that this goes beyond. Uh, 
other sources, and this, this is a yearly inflation in other countries. In general, what we are measuring is very similar to the official information. The only difference is, is Argentina. There's also the case of China, in which, since we do not have access to the, the caps on, on the baskets and we cannot monitor the same uh, amount of online pro, um, product, we produce the supermarket index that is fairly good. Uh, for example, this four that you see right here happened just after the China's uh, central bank decided to uh, uh, increase interest rates to reduce inflation. Reduced inf interest rates, sorry. And there are many people that suspect of uh, Chinese inflation statistics, believing that they're also lying about that. We found no evidence about it. The levels of inflation are very similar. Uh, unlike what happens in Argentina. I said that there are differences. Some of the most important is that just finding out if uh, the online information is uh, representative. Because I'm, and uh, now this is a little bit in English because I was looking at the match and I couldn't and tr finish translating the presentation. But uh, please forgive me, but I will translate what is now on the slides. And even uh, in develop, developed countries are 10% of the products where these are sold online. Or, however, online and offline markets entirely integrated, are entirely integrated in many countries. A lot of people usually do searches online and then buy offline. So the way in which price changes behave is very similar. And we have performed several studies with which we try to obtain online and offline data at the same time on different retailers. And we have found that in most cases, prices are identical. And in some others, the online site behaves as just another retail outlet of this um, commerce, but it does not have a very different price behavior. And this that, that we call the online store is, in practice, the largest uh, branch or the largest uh, outlet of these uh, retailers, for example, in the case of Walmart, online online business is about 8%, uh, but most do not sell more than 1% online. So these are very, very large types of retailers. That depends on the, on the case, of course, of the type of uh, of retailer we're discussing and the country. This is what we found in our study. Something that I believe is very important from the standpoint of the connection of statistics is a lot of a lot of what is done in statistics to correct, for example, issues such as um, quality adjustments have to do with the features of the data. And what I am showing on the left side graph is usually information uh, collected for the CPI. These are a few products. Uh, the, this is a hypothetical example of a television. It begins with a price of 100, and throughout its life cycle, its price falls. It eventually disappears from the retailer. And the person that is collecting uh, prices has to jump to another model. The problem is that the price history for that model did not was not collected. And we have to find out how much of this jump has to do with a change of quality or a change of price. And we have all in data of the price history of all this, but also all the varieties of the. So, uh, this simplifies the measurement of inflation tremendously. We do not do any type of adjustment, for example. Uh, however, we will um, approximate a lot to the level and the trend of those categories that countries such as in the United States um, use uh, more advanced techniques. And this is one of the ways in which this uh, approach of big data or the features of big data could mean a tremendous uh, uh, benefit, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of the quality of data, and it can simplify uh, a lot the way in which uh, inflation is measured. I'm somewhat be well, uh, hand schedule, so uh, I'm going to jump to the 
to anticipation to find out if we can anticipate CPI statistics for the United States. This graph summarizes it. This is when we have a shock in our data. How much does it take for it to be ex fully expressed at the CPI index in the United States? And what you can see here is that the peak takes place after four months. This means that the impact is not um, solely a matter of public publishing the data beforehand. The data uh, takes uh, four months to be expressed in official data. And we believe that that is because online prices react differently. With these added checks in the United States, there are many economic theories about what could be the cause of this. Economists discuss, for example, the cost of changing online prices that is very low uh, compared to the changing prices offline. That is consistent with this. But there are some topics that were important based on our experience. First, we found that online and offline prices behave similarly, that online prices tend to react before to, uh, to shocks, as I said before, that online data facilitates the handling or the management of new products and doing quality adjustments due to overlapping. Of course, we have to be very careful in the way in which data is cleaned and treated. It's not only about uh, downloading all this information and putting it in an index. We have to be very careful. We are not saying that one would have to abandon all the progress that has been made in methodological terms to treat and clean the data. Not at all. I think that is still tremendously important. And something else that I think is important to understand is that there are people that see online data as information in a very small subsector of the economy that we have to measure and adjust. We would think that the entire basket of consumer products, there is a very small fraction that is online, and we can take data to collect that fragment. But I do not think that is the best use. That should be understood only as an alternative data source with its advantages in some aspects. And basically, this provides information about the same thing we would obtain if we were a retailer trying to uh, get that data. This is information about related initiatives. I already mentioned that uh, there's a project at MIT, uh, another in Argentina for real inflation. I would like to conclude basically by saying that from the standpoint of uh, of economic analysis. Big data is uh, an important source to reevaluate these old questions we have had as academicians, and I also think it is an important source, a reliable source to measure inflation and these new characteristic, characteristics that data has can uh, save a lot of costs when using it in the statistical sector to replace a certain category of traditional data. And obviously, as I said as I said before, there are also other issues. I, my half hour has run out. I will be happy to take your questions. I hope you are older and have heard me. I have no idea if there's anybody on the other side. Um, so thank you very much.